after that wonderful introduction. But did we interrupt the pussy song? I think we interrupted the pussy song. Which was playing in lieu of actual news, because nothing happened, apparently. Oh, the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the news failed to launch today. My apologies. Yeah. Uh, I did search for an emergency backup news. I did not find it. So uh, we just uh, went straight back we, to the music. Yeah, we preempted it for the pussy song. It is Sunday, July 28th, 2019. You are listening to Cinema Smackdown. My name is Michael Brody. I am joined today by Shane Simmons. And we're going to talk about cult films today. We are not going to talk about the kind of movies that find a small audience that are greatly appreciated over time. We are going to talk about films that include cults and cult leaders. We're going to start off talking about movies that are based on reality, and then we're going to move into fictional cults. Reality? That's not fun. I know, I know. <coughs> on Thursday evening, on the first available show, Shane and I attended first possible screening of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the new Quentin Tarantino movie, mostly not out of pure love and excitement, just out of a desire to avoid spoilers. Because they're everywhere. People really, really want you to know what happens in this movie, and headlines for the film give away just about everything that it takes two hours and 40 minutes to reach. So I think we made a good choice. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll be sure to ruin it for everyone listening, right? We'll do that. I mean, the scene where Hans Landa showed up is, is, a, yeah, bit, yeah. is a bit shocking, I have to say. <laughs> they did do a good job of, sh- of surprising me with the, the, the Christoph Waltz cameo. Yeah, well, this is the, uh, the alternate history line that uh, Tarantino likes to build up, so, of course, we have to have Inglorious Bastards connections. But, of course, we do. Shane, tell me a little bit about your thoughts about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the new Tarantino movie, which does have a cult element. Uh, yes, so, uh, for those unaware, it is, uh, regarding the Manson family murders, to, to a certain degree, although we're largely following a increasingly has-been actor played by, uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, and his stunt double played by Brad Pitt. It's mostly their story, but we keep touching upon Sharon Tate, the doomed, um, victim to be of the Manson family, if you if you follow that case from 1969, and Tarantino spends an enormous amount of time meandering, to the point where uh, when we get to the final act and things start to move, you almost feel like you're watching a separate movie or a sequel to the meandering, feature length thing that you just sat through leading up to this. Mm-hmm. And uh, true to form to Tarantino, I think there was a lot of interesting thematic content to mine here, which he completely fails to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a guy who does not seem particularly uh, interested in having any sort of message, context, subtext, uh, or anything in any of his films. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do enjoy them, but I wish he would dig deeper. And uh, once again, he does not in this film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was, look, my first thought is it's a weird world where we're watching a movie in which Brad Pitt is the much lesser Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, this for me, it's personal, right? I don't like Leonardo DiCaprio. I liked him very much when he was 13. I found him interesting at that point in his career. I, uh, I lost interest in him right around the time he did Titanic. And it didn't mean he couldn't have won me back, but the entire rest of his career I found quite irritating to the point where I find he's one of those actors when he's in a movie I just don't buy him as a character I've never liked him post Mm. Titanic I find he's I mean on on a movie star visual level he's puffy looking which (laughs) I don't I mean that's that's not about performance yeah um, but there are there are certainly films it's not for lack of trying though I, I I think he has genuine talent and always has uh, I'm, he's not my favorite leading man by any means, but certainly he, he keeps making the right choices about who to work with. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you can't fault a guy for repeatedly working with Scorsese or I have Tarantino. A Scorsese or thing to tell you later. I hope I remember it because it is a hilarious tie-in to one of the movies I want to mention. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, no, who but, who is dumb enough to pass on making Scorsese movies again and again and again? But in every one of those films, he's the weakest thing in it. He's the thing I'm like, this doesn't work. You're not great in this movie. 
like here, here's a here's part of DiCaprio's career arc. Danny Boyle made uh, I'm gonna say three movies in a row starring Ewan McGregor. He made uh, Shallow Grave, Train Spotting, and then that really strange movie with Cameron Diaz. I can't remember the title. It's like Life as We Know It or Life and Something, something like that. And even that, it's an odd little interesting failure, but it's still interesting. They all starred Ewan McGregor. Then when it came time to do The Beach, he got an offer that DiCaprio could star in the movie. Mm -hmm. And he jettisoned his lead of all of his other pictures, much to McGregor's anger and dissatisfaction, because that role had, of course, been promised to him. And, and, DiCaprio, and I think he would have been better in it. Exactly. That's my point. In every one of these movies, someone would have been better. I, 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 and I don't say that about the pre-Titanic DiCaprio. Anyway, this is a long road to go down just to mention the fact that Brad Pitt doesn't always make my favorite career choices, but I genuinely like him in things, and he's an interesting and, and actor. And the, the idea that in this universe he would play second fiddle to DiCaprio is well, here's, ludicrous. Uh, yes, and that would have been my thought. It was my thought going in, but here was my thought ultimately. Brad Pitt has the cool guy part, and DiCaprio is a whining, blubbering mess through this entire movie. I had zero respect for him whatsoever. Like, his reaction to violence in this movie is, is <laughs> whereas Brad Pitt is, who do I have to hit? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, admittedly, just the way it's written is... DiCaprio is, is is dealing with a an increasingly failing career, and Brad Pitt plays a stuntman with very little ambition, yeah, but is just true. very good at being tough. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's kind of hard to mess up playing the guy who's tough and wins fights. It, here's the thing. I mean, we didn't really get into what's on time in Hollywood, and I doubt we're going to really go deep spoilers because we have so many other movies to talk about. But it is the most meandering, pointless film I've ever seen that is this good. <laughs> now, I didn't like the movie. My, my ultimate review of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Some of it offends me. Some of it bored me. But it's gorgeous. It's beautifully acted throughout. But it, it goes down road after road after road I'm not interested in. Yeah, there are fleeting moments of excellent characterization work done in it, but you have to really wait to get to it. Yep. Uh, but when those moments happen, they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research uh, going forward, having seen the movie, uh, and, and there were two things that I think are worth noting. One is a piece of trivia about the film, and one is just a, a Tarantino thing. The Tarantino thing is not related to this movie, but... He's increasingly become an annoying celebrity. He used to be very fascinating, and now I find just the sound of his voice kind of irritating. You're just getting around to that now? Well... I I've just, found I'm it just, kind of irritating from day one. I'm, I'm acknowledging that it's been a long time that it's been in that. I, I liked him in the very beginning when he had this insane amount of energy and was always championing these 70s movies no one ever yeah, heard of. Yeah, well, he kind of lost me right with his first film when he... He thanked him? everybody on the face of the earth except Ringo Lamb, who was the one guy he was ripping off the most. Yeah, I know, that's kind of crazy. But Tarantino still talks about film in an interesting way most of the time. <clears throat> and I heard him on a new interview just today that I, I listened to on the off chance he told something really interesting about this film. And this is a completely off the subject moment. Someone just said, So, what have, what have you been watching lately? And Tarantino said, Oh, I saw Under the Silver Lake, by far the best movie I've seen this year. <laughs> and I just thought, well, it's not my favorite movie of that year, but it's so quirky, and I'm so happy that if he's going to promote anything, it's something that weird and good. Yes, well, we're, we're among the people in the camp who like that film, so... And it is a hated, hated movie. And when among people, some people, but there, it, 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 speaking of cult movies, that one does well, A, have a cult, and you know, B, has a cult following. You're right, it, it is a cult movie. I forgot that it sort of does have this very strange guru... And, but it even has that other fellow playing a piano who God knows what that moment in that <laughs> film is. <laughs> but it's so but wonderful, it's, we it's don't care. magnificent. If you haven't seen Under the Silver Lake, and you start watching it, and you find yourself thinking, I can't watch any more of this, find the scene where a man is sitting behind the piano and make sure you watch that whole scene. Yeah, just, just it, it if, if you have to watch it out of context and abandon the rest of the film, 
that is at least the the standalone scene to watch. Absolutely, and and I, I do highly like that movie. I recommend it, but I recommend it with a huge warning. Like, yeah, you will watch it and send us hate mail. It it is almost the same warning I give for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This movie is slow. You're going to have to have your concentration has to be turned on for it. Yeah, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is considerably less weird though. It's very linear. Yes. It's, 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 there's nothing that that will send the masses into uh, convulsions of confusion. Mm. And it does seem like the entire movie is sort of a promotional tool for uh, spear guns, if you will. <laughs> you think that might be. Well, yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> just a man's weapon. There's something about it there, right? All right, well, speaking of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, we should talk a little bit about the other films that are in that genre of meaning. And there's been a lot of them recently. Well, specifically, I want to talk about all the Manson movies I've seen. Just real quick, because they're all based on fact, to some degree. Uh, in preparation for this show, I watched Helter Skelter. Oh, good on you. I, I have not seen that in a million Jeez. years. Three hours and five minutes long. Yeah, I, now, I saw that on videotape in the 80s, mm -hmm. so my memory is uh, thin it's, at best. It's a very, very workmanlike procedural. Mm -hmm. And it's a TV movie, so it has no dirty words, no violence on camera... No flashbacks. There, there is a crime scene moment where there's blood, but there's it is a very clean movie. And uh, in fact, it has an ad for Clorox right in the middle. <laughs> the performances are excellent, but uh, it is it is a slog. It's a bit of a slog. Of course, Steve Steve Railsback plays Manson, and he's astonishing in it. Oh uh, yeah, God, Steve Railsback. So there's that. There is uh, the stuntman, and there is uh, Life Force. And that's oh, all the Steve Farrell's back. Which one? He's in a movie called Turkey Shoot. Turkey Show. I've oh, been, yes, Turkey Shoot! Yes! I, I've been begging you to watch that for a decade. It's one of those, um, <laughs> I believe I've watched the fairly extensive Red Letter Media review of it, oh, as opposed to the film itself. The thing to do. It's a great movie. It's a great trash movie. Right, oh, it's trash, yeah. It is trash. It's, it's an exploitation film to the nth degree. It's any number of strange, strange things that, uh, anyway, at any rate, Steve Rill's back. Uh, he, he's one of those guys, <laughs> he's one of those guys, you will never, ever be able to believe this guy was hired to lead films once upon a time. It is kind of amazing, and uh, he's still out there. He's still out there. I think he's worked in the last few years, but he's in his 70s now. Uh, he does a pretty convincing job of playing Manson, and it did derail his career. Mm -hmm. It was too good. Uh, I do. I do have a fair bit more. To he he say. plays a bit of a psycho in every film he's in, though. Yeah, certainly. He's really weird in Life Force. He's he's really weird every, in the stuntman. Every, yeah, well, the stuntman is a built-in weird movie. I have a lot more to say about Helter Skelter and other films, but we will get back to those after these messages from our sponsors. Uh, well, obviously, this whole show has to be about Steve Rails. Fantasia. Yeah. Sorry. Say that again. Obviously, this whole show has to be about Steve Rails back now. We'll just rename it the Steve, Steve Rails back show. I have way more content than we'll ever get to. I'm sure. But um, this is all good. We're in this ad break. The next ad break, yeah. the, the ad says it's five minutes long. What? So I'm going to start it, and if yeah, I find a cut natural it off. end point in uh -huh. 20 or 40 seconds, it's going off. But it's four minutes and 45 seconds. That's insane. I just Who don't the hell know. cuts an... What is it, a PSA? I don't get it. I don't know what it is. Oh. It's what I've been directed to play, and we'll, we'll, we'll play a trailer for it. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like that's got to be an error because I almost feel like that needs a warning. Hey, play this ad, but you know, it's five minutes. Uh huh. We're cutting. Oh, we're, we're basically. Yep. <clears throat> and we're back on CJLO 6090. Our show is Cinema Smackdown. I'm Michael Brody. I'm joined by Shane Simmons. We're talking about cult movies today, and not the kind of cult movies that you have to seek out because they're sort of underground films. We're talking about cult movies where there's a cult leader and followers and things like that. Inspired by our viewing of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, we're talking about other Manson films. I mean, not that this is really a quote-unquote Manson movie, the Once mm -hmm. Upon a Time in Hollywood. But anyway, we're talking well, about... Well, yeah, it's related, though. We're talking about Helter Skelter first, which is the the film based on the book by Leo Buglio, Buliosi. You don't pronounce the G. Buliosi. Or is it, geez, I don't even know if I'm saying his name right at this point. But uh, at any rate, the lawyer who 
prosecuted Manson wrote a book about it, and they made a TV movie out of it. Now, here's the interesting connection to the TV uh, movie itself with the rest of Hollywood. The film is directed by a man named Tom Grease. I've never heard of Tom Grease, but I recognize the name Grease, G-R-I-E-S. And the film starts, and one of the first people you see in the movie, and this is only for people who will get this reference, is a young man by the name of uh, John Grease. G-R-I-E-S, who must have been his brother or his son or something. John Grease went on to star on a TV show called The Pretender, and he is a mainstay B actor. He's in Napoleon Dynamite playing the weird uncle. He's in a million things, but people who recognize him. He's also in um, Real Genius. You remember that film, Shane? Yeah, yeah. He's the weird guy in the basement. Okay. Now, he has a, sh a small part in Helter Skelter, as the guy they find in the house who wasn't killed. There's just somebody who didn't get killed. I don't, I don't even know what person that well, is. Well, which, which massacre first, was it? The first one. The first one. The, the tape murder, I think. I think. Are you sure it wasn't the second? Because I, I think know. everyone got wiped out with the tape murder. But anyway, they find a survivor, and he's just shell-shocked, and at first they just think he's the murderer. And they interview this actor, and it just astonished me to see him at 18 or 19 years old in 1976, playing this guy. Um... At any rate, yeah, Helter Skelter is not bad or anything, but it's 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 dry, it's factual. I read yeah, that docudrama. Yeah. Every scene you see in the courtroom is essentially just <coughs> literal depictions of words that were said, and that will really let you know what a whack job Charles Manson was because he does not say one thing in this movie that makes him seem like he understands what's going on. He just sounds like a raving lunatic in every moment he's in. And it kind of astonishes me that he managed to get that many followers, considering that just about every word he says is contradicting something else he said, and that he is just beyond crazed. He's just ranting. He's a, he says things like, I'm the devil, and then a moment later, I'm Jesus Christ. Well, you got to make up your mind. <laughs> Pick a side. <laughs> so, Helter Skelter is a big one. It's well known. Uh, this year saw the release of a Matt Smith Charles Manson movie called Charlie Says, which is barely a movie, in that I'd say it doesn't have a plot, you just wander around with mostly the women, he filters in and out. I've always found Matt Smith kind of looks like an alien to begin with, which was interesting yeah. because he played Doctor Who. But uh, this is the rare movie or TV show you will see in which Matt Smith actually has eyebrows. Now anyone who's familiar with him knows he's so blonde that he essentially has nothing above his eyes. But because they dye his hair black, and I assume he's wearing Merkin eyebrows, <laughs> he, uh, he actually has more expression on his face than usual. That's all I have to say about Charlie Says. But there's one other movie that's worth mentioning, a 1997 released film called The Manson Family, which was directed by Jim Van Beber, the great Jim Van Beber. Now, The Manson Family is the second version, I think, um, of a movie that I think he initially started making called, I think his original film was called Charlie's Family. It eventually was released as The Manson Family. But it had an over 10 year production because Van Beber had made a little movie called Deadbeat at Dawn, which had been tiny and mildly successful, enough that producers came to him and said, we'd like to fund your next movie. And with this information in hand, Van, Better, Van Beber rushed out and began filming his next movie without getting the money first. <laughs> he just took out loans and started making the movie because producers had told him he was getting some money. That money never arrived. So over the course of a decade, he shot footage for this movie, this Manson movie that he was making. He found a very compelling, strange actor to play Manson, but it took a decade to make the movie. And somewhere around the middle, that guy quit. So he's only in some of the movie and then sort of ceases to exist. <laughs> and yet the movie is, it's, it's psychedelic, but it's such successful, weird, emotional filmmaking. Uh, but what I really would want to mention, if I mention this movie at all, is I want to mention, at any opportunity, Deadbeat at Dawn. <laughs> because Deadbeat at Dawn is Van Beber's previous film. It was released in 88. And it is, if you ever want to see a DIY movie, a garage band version of a feature, a movie you know, a friend of yours put this together, but it came out pretty good. This is the best one of those ever made. You, I mean, you can see the string and the glue that's holding things together in this movie, and yet the intention 
the compassion, the the, the energy. The energy is unreal. There's a lot of action in this movie, and I'm pretty sure every time you see action in this movie, someone gets hurt. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like a, a another like El Mariachi a decade early. Uh, well, that's that's what well, it reminds me of. Well, it's four years early, but sure. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> four years before El Mariachi is this little an DIY 80s for a film versus a 90s film, whatever. Yeah. Cut. Late 80s and early Dispute 90s. me with math, why don't you? <laughs> At any rate, I loved Deadbeat at Dawn so, so, so much. A little movie about a gang war, but mostly about one man, the leader of a gang, named Goose, played by Van Bever himself. It has gunfights, car chases, kung fu, a lot of kung fu. And anytime anybody fights in this movie, it just looks like they're getting hurt. It just looks <laughs> like there's people being dragged behind cars, and you think, well... They're not faking that. That's a guy being dragged behind a car. <laughs> Someone gets hit in the face. It just looks like he got hit in the face. Like there's nothing. It it, it kind of reminds me of that guy who tried to make an independent Spider-Man movie. Yes. And he needed to have a guy in a Spider-Man suit swinging around rooftops on the end of a rope. So he just had a guy swinging around rooftops at the end of a rope, and it was incredibly dangerous. And you could just feel it in every frame of the film. Yes, and that guy is the director. Oh, it's him again. It's him, the director, the director of the Spider-Man movie. Oh yeah, no, no, it's not, it's not, it's Spider-Man not. Spider-Man. No, no, it's not. Okay. The, the guy who made that that little. Spider-Man well, yeah, of course. Movie. I mean, you gotta at that point you have to go Buster Keaton and just say, well, no one else is gonna do this crazy crap, so. You can drop the house on me. It's right <laughs> here. Uh, at any rate, yeah. So the Manson Family by Van Bever is is certainly an interesting film, but his little baby masterpiece is that beat it on. And damn if I don't wish that man had made forty movies, at any budget level. And he has not. He has not made another film since then. And I, I desperately want him to, someone to hand him a punch of money or, or just a small amount and say, get out there and do this. Get out there and do this thing. It's, yeah. it's a lot of promise. Yeah, there's a lot of those directors that we'll need to do a show about one day. The, the lightning in a bottle, one and done, or two and done type directors. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, with that said, that's why Manson movies I had to talk about. Do you have any to add, or are you all Manson out? I, I see the Manson case is not, uh, as far as the criminology history goes, I've never found it that fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, both basically, a, basically a bunch of dirty, disgusting, degenerate hippie scumbags <laughs> got together and murdered a bunch of people. Right. Uh, and after a couple of killing sprees, they got caught. You sound like everyone in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood the way they speak. It's yeah, you know what, I and I absolutely agree with that assessment of them. These are, the, the, some of these people are just absolute scum of the earth. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, I, I won't get into spoilers. I still want to get into spoilers, but I won't. I mean, we can we can hold the last five minutes of the show and really rip the, the, the movie and just give a huge spoiler warning and talk about the major plot. Time permitting, we might no have to do that, yeah. talk about, just to, so that we can just warn it enough, warn people enough. So let's talk about other cult movies, films that involve cults and cult leaders, but all the rest of them are going to be fictional. They're going to be things that people were inspired by. I have a giant list of movies, but we should probably start off with the main event, the movie from last year that I know you saw last night. Yeah, I did indeed. That I've been talking about. Critically acclaimed. For about six months. And I have mixed feelings about this movie. I don't. Oh, you're going, you're going negative. I'm, I'm, no, I'm going all in with my particular opinion. About let's hear this. it, let's, let's hear so, it. Now, now, the film we're talking about is Mandy. The Nicolas Cage, chainsaw-wielding, screeching, squealing, psychedelic murder movie. Yeah, the Nicolas Cage versus a cult movie. Yes. Uh, um, I can't remember the director's first name, but uh, Cosmatos, who is the son of... Uh, well, you're, you're going with his first name right now. His name is Panos? Panos, Cosmatos. that's not, Panos, yes. And his, his father was George, who mostly made trash. Uh, he made a few really respectable I liked, movies. I like, you know, Tombstone is That's his best fun. film. Uh, it's a bit trashy, but again, yeah, and then you look at the rest of his film, they're kind of trash. Now his son has taken up the mantle. But he makes very different movies. Oh yes, they are extremely different films. I mean, yeah. uh, Mandy uh, aspires to be a certain type of trash, which I quite enjoy. Uh, and so I've been aware of this film for a year. I haven't gotten around to it. I am a Nicolas Cage apologist. I think Nicolas Cage should be allowed to eat as much scenery as he cares to. Uh, I will happily hand him a knife and a fork and say, go for it, Nick. Um, and I was assured that this would be uh, among the ultimate Nick The scenery-eatingest Nick Cage. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I still will okay. vote for uh, Vampire's Kiss being the ultimate Nick, Nicolas Cage uh, eats the entire set. Um, there are 30 years of difference between those movies, though, so it, I, it's quite something to watch. I looked up the critical reaction to this film after I saw it, because I, I did want to know what the mainstream press had to think of it, because it, it does have a very exploitational uh, element to it, and like I said, I am a fan of that, so was, I was uh, genuinely looking forward to seeing this, finally. And uh, it was quite celebrated uh, among mainstream uh, critics. This is uh, the biggest build-up ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I had to say, you know, uh, what is the most erudite, uh, level-headed, uh, uh, carefully worded uh, micro-criticism I can offer of this film? And I came up with, uh, uh, Mandy is a stupid-ass piece of shit. <laughs> it is... One of the worst movies I've had to sit through in recent decades. I do not share your opinion. However, <laughs> however, it comes as no surprise to me. When I saw it, I did not love it. I did not necessarily even enjoy the experience of sitting through it because it has lots of psychedelic imagery, which I which is never paint enjoyed. drawingly slow. Yeah, I don't, I don't enjoy that. However. It made me long for the rocket pace of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. They're about the same. No. Uh, no, I'm yeah. going to have to disagree there. I know you saw them a lot closer together than me, but... At any rate, I don't hate Mandy. I, I like the performances in it. To a degree, they're comically cartoonish. They're, the filmmaking is very strange. But I do like a lot of what Cage does in this movie, and, and it's just unhinged weirdness. I will say, yes, everything... Every utterance of Nicolas Cage in this film is ludicrous and makes no sense. Sure. Even, even before the bad stuff happens. <laughs> From his opening line. Knock, knock. <laughs> that, that moment is... Please, please repeat this entire first line that Nicolas Cage has. Is that his first line? Yes, it is. It is his first spoken words in this in film. In bed with his girlfriend? No, he comes home. He's a lumberjack. Uh, we get a little bit of character moment because he's a sort of lumberjack who smokes on a job and then flicks his cigarette into the stumpy remains of trees. Cool Probably not a real good idea. He refuses a drink on a helicopter back to base, which, you know, is supposedly the indication that, yeah, he used to be an alcoholic and he stopped. Fine. Yeah. He comes home to his remote cabin in the woods with his wife, and he comes up to her, and she's drawing, and he tells her, knock, knock. <laughs> and she says... Who's there? Eric Estrada. Eric Estrada who? Eric Estrada from Chips. And that's the joke. And that's the joke. And it's... That is our hero's first lines <laughs> in this motion picture. I kid you not. And that, as nonsensical as it is, and no punchline as it is... Everything he says after that thing, makes less sense. Yeah, probably. At any rate, I... I, when I saw this movie, I, I did tell you, I'm not sure if you should see this. But then it became such a cultural phenomenon that I knew you had to. I had to. Just to be able to keep I up I had to, but I still deeply resent you. That's that's how it goes. Yeah. Like I said, like I don't hate the movie, but I certainly didn't enjoy the experience of watching it. Now that I have seen it, I can look back now, on it. Now, keep in mind, keep fun. in mind, I was 100% on board with a Nicolas Cage versus a cult movie where he kills them with chainsaws and axes out of heavy metal. Uh -huh. By all means, make that film and go as extreme as you want, and I will like it. Even on an exploitation level, this is uninventive, pretentious rubbish. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish kept, you wouldn't hold back so much. When I kept shows. waiting for the inventive violence to happen, and it never did. And meanwhile, it's, it's even structured wrong. You're listening to CJLO 1690, <laughs> proud sponsors of the Panos Cosmatos Mandy movie. <laughs> I, I'm sure he'll call in at any moment to join us as our third, uh, third voice on the show today. Our show today is Cinema Smackdown. We're talking about cults and cult movies, movies that feature cult leaders and cult people. We have discussed Manson movies. We are now getting into fictional movies, but we have only talked about one so far. The movie Mandy. Yeah. Which, uh, we certainly don't disagree on our opinion of the movie, but I'm just... I think my six months of hearing people love it so much have, have not angered me, as it will often do. Mm -hmm. They've softened me, too. It's, it's got its place. It's, I just don't care about yeah, movies. Yeah, in else. a rubbish heap. 
I just don't care set on fire. Movies with long psychedelic moments <clears throat> just do not work for me. This is a film, so it has a semi-supernatural element to it. But basically, uh, his, when he goes to seek revenge, Nicolas Cage goes up against what can only be described as drug-dealing biker gang Cenobites. Uh, yeah, which is fine. That's part of the movie yeah, I like. Fine, except he fights and defeats them first before going after the soft, squishy, idiotic human characters. Yeah, it's, it's, so well, you're, I mean, you're setting you yourself do? up for an anticlimax. Uh, it's, I don't know if I called the end of if, the movie If he had gone after the humans responsible for the bad thing and wiped them out first, only to find out, oh, by the way, the real power behind these guys was a gang of drug-dealing biker Cenobites... <laughs> and I now I have to defeat this, so I better get really drugged up in order to deal with this, you know, Ash versus Evil Dead level of <laughs> battle that I have to do. Then you might have had something. Very true. But that would have required intelligence and inventiveness, which this film is bereft of. <laughs> well, I'm sure over the next few months we're going to bring up Mandy quite a few times. Oh, so yeah, that, that scar... I'm going to keep picking at that scar. That's fine. That's what Mandy is. It's a scar on, the, on my back in a spot I can't quite reach. <laughs> uh, let's I can on. reach it, but it's getting all pus-filled yeah. and swollen. Oh, that sounds about right. So let's talk about a few more movies, some of which I'm sure you like more. Um, so, we both watched The Apostle last year. Yep. I have I've even seen movie. it twice now. Uh, that's once more than I need to see. Yeah, well, I want to show it to people. I like so. it. I think that it is... 80% the movie I'd like it to be, and then it has CGI, which kills at minimum 20% of yes, the Yes, I would have much movie. preferred it without the CGI, but... Um, you, you remove every drop of CGI from that movie and replace it with practical effects, and it will radically alter my opinion of it. it is yeah, it'll, it'll films, get original Wicker Man good. Yeah, and, but it's not because of that reason. It's, too, it's, it's a plain, flat movie with these shiny moments that don't fit. But as, as right far as, because it is a cult rescue mission movie, yeah. where a guy somewhere around the turn of last century has to go into a cult somewhere in the British Isles, a little uh, rocky bit of nowhere, uh, to get his sister out who has been kidnapped by this cult for a ransom. Yeah. And this is a Dan Stevens, Michael Sheen movie. Yes, uh, among written and directed by Gareth Evans, who's better known for the Raid movies. Yep. And, I mean, it made me want to watch his next film, and it made me want to scream at his producer, don't let him touch CGI. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do. This is the guy who made the raid, where people kick each other in the chest hard, and you feel the yeah, well, hits. The rules are rather different in Indonesia than they are in the, the British next Isles. I drag Dan Stevens to Indonesia and cut his fingers off in a scene so that I know it's happening for real. <laughs> at, at any rate, I, I, I apologize well, to Dan Stevens, he's a fine actor. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's interesting because um, it's not a single cult later. It's basically three. It's the three founding members of this uh, little island community. And to varying degrees, uh, especially with the main one, Michael Sheen, he's semi-sympathetic. You kind of feel... Semi. He, Semi. he has... He's not an evil man. But things have gone very badly with this plan. But there are very, very evil. Yes, there are. Yes. And it's effective. It's a very effective movie in its own way. And it is not scared of getting really, really harsh, yeah. uh, as you might know from the man who gave us the Raid films. Yeah, I'd say it's even harsher than those in ways. In certain, in certain personal, tactile ways. Yeah, in, when the violence happens, it, there, there's insane. no element of, wow, that's so much fun, because it's an action movie. This is not an action movie. Right. So when the violence happens, it's just disturbing. Let's move on to another film I really enjoyed that has a cult aspect, although it's not super well defined, is the movie The Invitation from 2015 by Karen Kusama, starring Logan Marshall Green, which is just a slow burn with massive payoffs, great mood. I love that it's just basically a guy going to a, a little dinner party, it's very calm, but there's just an It, it has that mood of... Something uh... is deadly wrong. Of, uh, yeah, come to our dinner party. Now, let me tell you about Amway. Yes, in the cult way. In a, in a cultish. Or... Yeah, but it is, it is a, such a well-realized movie. It feels like something. It, it's a real character study as well, which uh, it does enormously well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so The Invitation, high recommendation. 
Here's here's one I just want to mention <coughs> just in passing because it's a cult movie, mm -hmm. even though people would have you believe otherwise. Uh, the Master by Paul Thomas Anderson, starring Joaquin Phoenix and Philip Timur Hoffman. It, it's a movie about watching somebody be indoctrinated into a cult. That's all the movie is. It's watching Philip Timur Hoffman's character figure out how to convince people to be on his side, and he uses Joaquin Phoenix as his measuring stick, because Joaquin Phoenix plays a psychopath in this movie who flips out at a moment's notice at everything. He's, a, he's an animal, and you think, and it's, I, there, I barely understand this film. I know what the basis is, I get the gist of it, but minute by minute, I don't understand why it exists. So, <laughs> uh, well, it's, you know, it, clearly it's said that Joker origin story. It feels a little like that. At any rate, The Master, which is, of course, a nod, big, big, big nod to the origins of Scientology, is a very... Yeah, as, as pretty much every cult film these days kind of has to be, to some degree or other. You, it, it is the model of how cults are formed. Mm -hmm. Another, it's, it's the business model for it, is what it is. Yeah, I don't have much to say about that one. I, I, I have fallen so out of love with Paul Thomas Anderson that it isn't even, it isn't even a conversation for me anymore. I love his he, first uh, three movies, and then... They've nothing. increasingly become not imp appointment movies. Yeah. But I'm, you didn't want to watch two and a half hours of Daniel Day-Lewis sewing? I don't understand. Yeah, that one I, I, I'm afraid I had to skip. And, and it is a beloved movie with a lot of interesting aspects, but it is not a movie for me. I would say it's more interesting than a lot of the other ones. At any rate, let's move on. Here's one that, that does not get a lot of love, is a, a bit of a rough watch overall. And again, please stop opening that CGI box, especially in 1995 when you didn't know what the hell you were doing, and it's a messy digital garbage thing. But if you take those elements out of this, the actual mood of this film is astonishingly effective. It's a Clive Barker movie called Lord of Illusions. Did you ever see this? Oh, I... I think I have not. It stars Scott Bakula, of all people, playing kind of a heroic private detective, but the movie centers around a cult, and a cult leader, and it's mystical and supernatural in its nature, and it's really an angry, angry film. So the cult moments all feel like everyone is about to be murdered at any moment. There is such violence and effective horror in the, in the tone it is not a successful movie overall, but it's a really interesting failure. You know those movies? Mm -hmm. You watch them and you go, I see the good movie inside this, trying to get out. It is a movie in which they introduce someone at the beginning of the film who's clearly evil, and they dispatch him. And you're like, alright, I guess that's the James Bond opening where they get rid of something. And the entire rest of the movie... It's not made clear until the end. The entire rest of the movie is his cult trying to resurrect him. And once you realize that's the point of the movie, you can reevaluate the opening scene. You go, oh, it's not a throwaway scene. This is the story we're watching. It's all about this cult leader who's got sort of powers and is very scary and dangerous being put down and coming back bigger. And when you get near the end of the movie, it's, it's nightmarish. When he finally returns, it's rough. And I like that movie, but you're, you don't go into the film knowing that's what you're watching. It takes until the end of the film to even realize what you're building up to. So that's why I say it's an interesting failure. It should be made more clear early on what kind of a ride you're on, because it always felt like a movie looking for a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. at any rate, it's still, it's still of note. And, and it's another filmmaker. Clive Barker made three movies, and I wish he'd made 30. Because they're all interesting. He made Hellraiser, Nightbreed, and this. He made Lord of Illusions. That's it. That's his career. Everything else with Clive Barker's name on it is some bastardization of a short story he wrote adapted by someone else. And they're not the same as the movies he made. His films, I find, a cut above. They're all very interesting. And they've all, they are all true cult movies in that they are all really well liked and other than Hellraiser never found a real big audience. Certainly not Lord of Illusions. At any rate, um, moving on to much classier cult movies, or certainly what one might call a high-end art house film, we have Martha Marcy May Marlene, which I take it you haven't seen. No, I'm afraid not. No. So you're going to spoil it for me now, aren't you? It, I mean, it's an overtly cult movie. It's pretty obvious from the first ten minutes, but it's, it, it's, it's a movie. 
Mm-hmm. It's a very, very effective mood piece, but do not go into it looking for a rock-solid story with an ABC plot. It is simply enjoy these actors doing their thing. They're very, very good in it. The tone's amazing, and the quote-unquote cult leader is played by John Hawks. Oh, yeah. And he is, as he has been in several works of his, this and... What's the... Winter's Bone. Winter's Bone, Bone, yeah. He just feels big. He feels so big. He he walks into a... a You can feel the danger coming off him. You can feel the evil spirit surrounding him in both these roles, I find. He's just, he's bigger than life. There's something about his performance in this. At any rate, that's Martha, Mar- Martha Marcy May Marlene from 2011, which actually stars Elizabeth Olsen. She's good in it, too. Let's move on to a film we've both seen and uh, enjoyed for lots of reasons, despite ourselves, which would be mm. Red State, the Kevin Smith uh, yes. cult movie. Yes. Now, that cult in this is a version of Catholicism. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's an evil preacher, but they're pretty culty. They are certainly... Their flock is... Crazy mesmerized by that preacher. And I would be too, because Michael Parks gives an amazing sermon in this film, which is a centerpiece for the entire thing as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's riveting. Uh, I'll jump around a and, little and, bit. And I have to say, mm-hmm. um, and I was absolutely stunned that I enjoyed this film, because um, anything Kevin Smith does that does not have the word clerks in it, I despise. Right. It's it's up there. I hear you. His recent work has certainly... Whereas I saw Red State, and it is a bit torture porny. It's a bit messy as a film. It's a bit messy, goes. but my reaction was, if this had been the first film from a director, yeah. I would have said, now there's a promising young director I want to keep an eye on. Unfortunately, it was about Kevin Smith's tenth film. And it is the movie he made right before Yoga Hosers. Uh, and, <laughs> no, and, and Tusk. Tusk. He made Tusk. Right? Yeah. Which... which the more people hate that movie, the more it goes up to my esteem. And, and don't See, get me wrong, I know why people hate that movie, and it deserves to be hated. But I, I, I like it despite myself. I like it. Yeah, I, I, I like the elements that are the most bizarre and uncomfortable and unsettling, and then there's the dumbass comedy elements of it that just tear the I, whole I, film down. I'd say there's even more and worse things than the comedy elements, and yet... And yet. Yeah, yeah it, it's on a nightmarish level, it sort of is an interesting, again, torture porn type of horror movie. Yeah. Uh, real quick before we go to commercial, let's mention another movie Suspiria. Or, oh, yeah. or yeah. in your Edgar Rice voice Suspiria. Suspiria, as Edgar Wright put it on his Trailers from Hell short commentary. For Where he show. talked about both the European and the American trailer for Suspiria. Oh, that's right. Uh, Suspiria falls fairly squarely into it. It is culty. It is definitely people being brought into a group that is everyone is sort of mesmerized. Well, and, culty in a in a coveny sort of way. Very true. Well, we're gonna take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back talking about cult films, and maybe we'll do a little spoiler on what's going on. Hmm. It went from saying five minutes to 30 seconds once I clicked it. Oh, okay. But it initially said four minutes and such things. So it's Crazy. Like, no issue. Okay. But the, the running time listed shifted. Mm-hmm. And it also did a beat where it went dead silent for a second, so maybe it has a glitch that makes it read wrong. Uh-huh. It means we don't have to figure out how to silence it. Do you have anything else to say about Suspiria, or should I just leave Oh, forward? not overly. I mean, I, I haven't seen the remake, so. If you take whatever you hated about Mandy, <laughs> put it directly on that movie, but time's a hundred. If you don't hate that movie like I hated that movie, I don't know you. <laughs> Which almost makes me say you should see it, but you should never put yourself through it. I will, though, because you're still disappointed, so. It will hurt you. Yeah, it probably will. Her performance in it will... I mean, at first you'll go, interesting, and then you'll just get mad at her and stay mad at her for two, two hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> We're back on CJLS 6090. Our show is called Cinema Smackdown. We're talking about cult movies today, which is cult leader movies, not cult films that you would seek out at your local... And in the break, I was being warned about how much I would hate the Suspiria remake. But, I mean, 
The people who probably are okay with that film because I like the original. But are yeah. apologists to the? I've never heard someone just say it's so good. I have heard people say. I really like that I've seen it and it's this thing, but then they just keep talking because they need to explain that it really hurt them to sit through it and they hated it, but they want to say good things. I mean, it's just always apologizing. So um, while we're on cult films, we uh, should mention perhaps a double feature of uh, Hereditary and Midsummer. No? Sure. Yes? No? Sure. I, I, I wasn't Cause bothered because I, I really dislike that film. I know. No, I, I, yeah. A lot of stuff that I'm just like I don't have any. I uh, I'm in the camp of I kind of respect what he's done, but I don't necessarily like it. And you have like problems it. with Tarantino for ripping off Ringo Lamb. <laughs> uh, well, look, you know, it's it's uh, the cult uh, horror movie genre subgenre has been well tread. Um, yes, but but um, uh, what's it called? The first one. Uh, Hereditary. Hereditary is. A blatant structural ripoff of Rosemary's Baby, which oh, that's a, I think that's pushing it. It's in there. It's all in there, and it's it's in there in a way that I don't want. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want this. I don't want to be reminded of these aspects of Rosemary's Baby in a middling, irritating, whining, blubbering movie like this. And uh, he's one of those guys who is operating on a certain level, which is a high level as a filmmaker, but I hate what he does, and I never want to see another film by him based on Hereditary. <laughs> like, I haven't seen Midsummer. No, yeah, I have not. Uh, and the yes. reviews for it make me think I'm just going to be angry for two hour and a half hours. By the way, the movie is, I believe, two and a half hours, and there is a three hour cut that he's threatening to release. Yay! Yay! Which I hear is just more scenes of people walking in the woods looking <laughs> uh, at any rate, he is a filmmaker who irritates me, and maybe one day he'll make something that'll work for me. But at the moment, you know, um, it's like David Robert Mitchell. You either like It Follows, or it angers you deeply. I, have I even met anyone who I have hates met, I have It met Follows? I have met and heard from people who are angry about It Follows because they feel like it is an interesting premise that it just fails to deliver on. I kind of get what they're saying, but I, I like completely disagree. With I that, like but. the choices he made to how to tell that story. But I've heard people say, but but they don't answer anything. And I would I goes, would ask someone who hates that film. So what type of horror movies do you like? Right. And they'll probably say, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Friday the Thirteenth series. Right. To which I'll say, well, then go to hell. <laughs> See, I like both series. See, I'm in a bad mood because you made me watch Mandy last night. Didn't make anyone watch anything. <laughs> You said you should probably see Mandy before we do this show. I was like, well, I sure did. And you sure did. And yeah. I feel I feel very justified now. Yeah. Because anything that brings an emotion... Just because you were right doesn't mean I hate you any less. You're you're entitled to your opinion. So we, we have mentioned... Uh, I think his name's Ari Aster. Is that his name? The guy who made those films? I have not committed it to memory. So, oh, go, sure. yes. Ari That's Aster. totally his name. And uh, we mentioned him. Uh, some, more, some more cult movies, of course. The big one. Wicker Man. Yeah. The Wicker Man is a very... Not the bees! Oh, wait, not that one. <laughs> Speaking of crazy Nicholas Cage performances. Uh-huh. Um, the original Wicker Man, directed by Robin Hardy, starring Edward Woodward. And do you know what... This is an old joke that I heard once that doesn't make any sense, and yet I'm delighted by it. Um, what do you get if you take the D's out of Edward Woodward's name? You get... Iwa Wuwa. <laughs> that that is better than Nicolas Cage's Eric Estrada joke. Uh, yeah. At any rate, The Wicker Man is not my favorite movie, but it certainly works. It's an effective little twilight. I, I hate to say this. It's a Twilight Zone episode in its own way. Yeah. It's an Outer Limits. It's a simple, structurally Many films sound are. little moment movie. It has one idea or two ideas it gets across that's all it is it's very very simple very effective but I will say at the point in the movie in which Christopher Lee graces us with a five minute song on the piano I want to claw my own eyes out. <laughs> and I don't dislike Christopher Lee I'm happy to watch him do just about anything he won the war for us I'll have you know I've heard I've heard things oh here's here's my Christopher Lee anecdote I just heard the other day uh-huh. 
So uh, Filmmaker was at Christopher Lee's house working with him on a small project when he was about 75. And he said, you know, Christopher, I've heard you did big things in the war. And he said, I don't like to talk about that. And he turned to Lee's wife. He said, can, can you make him tell me something about this? And Christopher Lee and he goes, listen, listen, just between me and you, can you keep a secret? And this filmmaker said, yes, I can. And Christopher Lee said, so can I. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> If you don't know, Chris really worked in British intelligence back during World War II, and he knows stuff, or knew stuff. I it went to the grave the with him. The implication is that he was a Nazi killer. That he was a Nazi hunter and killer. Uh, I don't think he was probably a personal assassin, but I think he was involved in operations that yeah. uh, did a lot of the subterfuge behind the scenes stuff, which the British were very good at. Well, Shane, we have nine minutes left. Would you like to talk about so less than that. Would you like to talk about more random cult movies, or would you like to go deep spoilers on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? I don't know. Do you have any really must mention this cult film? Okay, so let's let's. Well, let's I can say the, I'll say the list. Here are just cult movies. Yeah, we're not going to talk about them. The Village, The Ninth Gate, Martyrs, Starry Eyes, House of the Devil, and because it kind of fits, Cabin in the Woods. They all oh, have yeah, elements. Yeah. They all have elements. Oh, and I will throw in uh, Bad Times at the El Royale. Uh, yes, lot of, lot very, of very, very, very solidly a Manson Wink Wink movie. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, a lot of those films I quite liked. I will also recommend, because there's a Polanski connection, The Ninth Gate. Uh, I didn't mention it. Yeah, it's on my list. It's on my list. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was on your, you passed on your Gate. list. Yeah. I'm a fan of The Ninth Gate. I know people who hate it, but I really like it. It's dumb. It's it, easy. It's just a series of scenes. It, it is in my top two Polanski films, personally. I yeah. You were, I thought you were more eh about it. Uh, no, no. I love that one, and I love the pianist. I didn't even know that. This those, those, revel- those are my two this Polanski is a films. Revelation to me. Yeah. So not Rosemary's Baby. Not nope. The Tenant. Not even Chinatown. Not, uh, not, not Pirates. <laughs> <laughs> no one's favorite film. Yeah. I quite like Pirates, but it's despite how it fights me trying to like it. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit in depth about. Huge spoilers, the ending and therefore point of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yes. So, uh, once again, spoiler starting now. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Tarantino, and I went into the film saying, is he going to do the exact same thing he did in The Glorious Bastards, mm-hmm. where he rewrites history? This is the way it should have been. And he does make us watch a two-hour and 39-minute movie featuring a Sharon Tate uh, performance? I don't know how you put it. It's, of a it's, person walking through a movie on clouds, being yeah. adored everywhere she goes. And showing off her feet a lot because it's Tarantino. Just being loved and loving life. And, and having so much potential. And the whole film you're kind of going, oh, I know how this ends. Yeah, it ends very, it's, very bad. It's just happy, 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 potential, potential, potential. And then, well... Nothing happens to her. Nothing happens Not in this narrative, her. anyway. She's fine, because this Be- is the movie in which the Manson family decide... Let's go next door instead! Let's go next door instead. And because of a chance encounter that only happens in this Tarantino universe, I mean, they what? decide, you know what, we should stop at this other house first. Get some murdering done there, before we go to the house that we're actually directed to by Charles Manson. And I honestly don't understand why. I don't get it. I don't see why you'd want to tell this story. It is, it is much like, um, it's like, oh, well, let's give people the cathartic experience of watching Hitler get machine gunned in the face. That I get. I don't care about that, and I didn't like that movie, I'm sure some but people, I get it. I'm sure some people will call this uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood a love letter to Sharon Tate. It isn't. What it is, it's a hate letter to the Manson family. Yeah, because it really, it really, really, really is. Because it, it gets down to, well, this is what should have happened to these absolute degenerate scumbags. Right. So and they go to the wrong house, and, it's, and it answers the question, what if there was one person on the premises who could handle himself? And of course, he's super loaded. Oh yeah. It, it, I mean, he's so high. The tension is brought to, by the fact that even though we've seen uh, Brad Pitt's character handle himself to the point where he hands Bruce Lee his ass at one point in the film... <laughs> It, the, the, highlight. The, the, yeah, it is a highlight. The, the suspense of the scene is 
Um, because of what's going on in their lives, uh, Brad Pitt's character is very, very drunk and has just smoked an acid cigarette, so he's also very, very high and doesn't quite know what reality is at that moment that three members of the uh, Manson family burst into the house with a gun drawn and knives out, ready to stab and murder everybody there, and his reaction to it is, I have to say, kind of priceless. Everything having to do with Brad Pitt in this movie is kind of wonderful. Yes, yes. He, and if he if was, the whole film had focused on him, mm-hmm. I think we would have really had something great. Yeah, because, uh, again, the whining, blubbering Leonardo DiCaprio performance, which has a scene in it in which he does a little acting, and it's him acting, good or bad, is completely decimated for me by people turning to him immediately after that moment going, You're so good! It just made me angry at him. I was like, no, he wasn't that good. He was good. Not that but he... I didn't want the movie to tell me he was good. No, exactly. You That's don't need point. that element. That's what you don't. Me. It, it would have been great, actually, if his great performance had been dismissed as, yeah, you're just a B-level TV actor now, and we don't care. Yeah. Uh, that would have felt... It would in, have felt genuine. And, you know, I, again, the, the, the writer in me keeps wanting to rewrite elements of this film. And, uh, you know, if there had only been some subtext to the film about how Hollywood demands rewrites constantly and is always pushing for, oh, you know, I signed on to this for the dour ending and you slapped on a happy ending. And in the film, it literally slaps on a happy ending. You might have had, oh, I think you're telling me something as opposed to, no, I just want to have a self-satisfied scene where I murder members of the Benson family in the most brutal way you could think to murder some people. They they really get it hard There's in this also film. There's some wild overreaction murder stuff. There is. Think, there is. And yet I, exactly I did find that sequence this. enormously happily satisfying. Well, it's great. Uh, but it is, it is. It's just such a messy little But it ultimately in, in, in this re- the way he rewrites history in Inglorious Bastards is one thing. Where, you know, it's like, well, you know, it basically ends the war early and Hitler gets machine gun in the face, but the outcome is ultimately the same. Whereas this, this is a very personal murder, series of murders that happened. And to rewrite it this way seems exploitational and crass, as Indeed. opposed to the longing, oh, if only reality had worked out like this. It's like, no, I, I, I it, it don't agree where you're coming from. It does a disservice. I find it satisfying. I know why he did it because I feel satisfied when it happens too. But I, the question is, is this in good taste? And no, not really. Yeah, ultimately, I don't like it. Although I can't fault the movie for filmmaking; it's a wonderfully made movie in on many, many levels. So, thumbs up and yet thumbs down all at the same time. It's it's uh, once upon a time in God damn, there could, it could have used an editor though. It's an odd choice of storytelling. At any rate, we're pretty much out of time. My name is Michael Brody. I've been joined today by Shane Simmons. We have been offering our thoughts on cult movies. This show has been called Cinema Smackdown. Join us again next week when our topic will be not cult movies and possibly something else. We'll see you then. Have a great weekend. The news did not come on. It did this and then stopped. <coughs> And nothing. It's gonna start playing auto in a second. Okay. But it won't play news, and it's not on the screen. Really? I couldn't find it. Yeah. I couldn't find the news. There? Oh, great! Yeah, please play it. No, just, just hit it. I didn't realize it was there. Just, just double click. Or CJ Allen. Or CJ Allen News. I'm I feel better now. <laughs> so the stuff is happening in the world. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for smart. Thank God. <laughs> Kanasataki Grand Chief Sir Simon is in a meeting with federal and provincial officials this morning to discuss the recent dispute over a land transfer. Oh, by the way, I'll be gone um, August 13th to the 26th. I'm going back home. Um, so if you guys wanted to do the longer show. I will definitely think about it. And thank you for the warning because it could give us a chance to program something if we're so inclined. I'm not doing it. Simon announced that he would only meet with Kim Yong after he apologizes for his controversial comments.